Sir Anish Kapoor, known for sinuous curves, saturated pigments, mirrored reflective surfaces that invert images, fractal and smooth, and deep sculptural voids, was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 2013. Kapoor, age 66, grew up in India. His father was a Punjabi Hindu from Mumbai and his mother a Baghdadi Jew from Iraq. After boarding school in India, Kapoor left for Israel to study engineering, as he says all good Indian boys do, and a few years later to study art in England. I first became interested in Kapoor's work while traveling in Australia with my husband several years ago. Dave said emphatically that he did not like modern or contemporary art and would not go to the exhibition with me. When we got to the Contemporary Art Museum in Sydney, he picked out a cafe in which to wait, but the sight of Kapoor's sky mirror by the entrance intrigued him, and so he joined me. The show was a delightful revelation for both of us. We loved the bold colors of some of the works, the reflections of others, the illusory effects, and the mysterious depths of others. Our review was that it was incredible, mysterious, and inspiring. Dave was converted. Perhaps best known in the United States for Cloudgate in Chicago's Millennium Park, Kapoor has created public space outdoor huge sculptures along with huge indoor sculptures. Cloudgate is 110 tons, 60 feet long, costs $23 million, and is surrounded by built and natural forms. Each side reflects differently. The city side reflects skyscrapers, and the park side reflects trees and greens. Of course, the top reflects the sky and the bottom the viewers underneath. But then again, with this shape, how many sides are there? An infinite number? Each position transforms what is reflected. Kapoor is interested in the magical and says whether it generates enough of that non-physical, non-object related character. The other side of the coin is that when whatever you're doing becomes active, it's a short trip from Disneyland to something truly mysterious. Truly mysterious implies that there is something else going on. It is a matter of meaning. Charles Jenks in the History of Postmodernism writes, this reflective being flatters the ugly and makes the boring fantastic, jokey and serious, superficial and conceptually sound. Leonard Bernstein said, any great work of art is great because it creates a special world of its own. It revives and adapts time and space, and the measure of its success is the extent to which it invites you in and lets you breathe its strange and special air. Cloudgate, often called the bean, lets you do just that. It invites you into its space and to see the space beyond. In a certain reflection, one can see Frank Gehry's J. Pritzker Music Pavilion at the next part of the Millennium Park. Stainless steel and with every edge visible and seemingly lacking order and grace. For all the grandeur and visibility of those structures, I wish herein to focus on Kapoor's use of color and sculpture, in particular his descent into limbo created in 1992. However, to put that piece in context, I think it's more important to look at the other works first and learn about Kapoor's own thoughts as an artist. When we look at the elements of sculpture, line, shape, texture, value, scale, color, and form, we can trace a number of different threads through Kapoor's work. Over his 40 plus years as a working artist, he has explored and engaged in a vast array of different materials, such as pure pigment, wax, fabric, steel, wood, stone, air, and cement. His explorations of lines include sinuous curves, straight lines, fractals, and nature's irregular lines. There is no form or shape that has not occurred in Kapoor's work, organic and industrial, random and planned, self-made and carefully planned. Almost every conceivable texture has been included, rough, smooth, irregular, regular, familiar and unfamiliar, ephemeral like pigment and solid like steel membranes like skin and deep voids that perhaps have no tangible texture, reflective surfaces and spaces that disappear. Gravity is an element that is relatively undiscussed with respect to sculpture, but it plays an important part in some Kapoor works. Kapoor's scale range is vast also from intimate scale in-gallery objects asking for close attention 
to huge public architectural structures like Cloudgate and the towering almost 400 foot tall ArcelorMittal orbit built for the London Olympics. It dwarfs humans and yet invites them inside to look out and outside to look in, to stand still and to use this exterior slide to see it and experience in motion. Kapoor's interest in style also includes huge in-gallery constructions like the aubergine colored Leviathan, which totally filled the Grand Palais in Paris. And the red Marcias, with 150 tons of red skin membrane created for Tate Modern's turbine hull. These pieces all ask the viewer to engage, to see from different viewpoints, inside, outside, below, and below. Color is of particular importance to Kapoor. As we know, what we see as color is a refraction of light on an object from water vapor that creates a rainbow to a solid object or molecule, a point absorbing all the spectrum other than one color. But color is more than meets the eye, the visual image of color. Kapoor sees color as, quote, thing and non-thing, mystery avoid, perceptual ambiguities of concave and convex, aspects of the bodies, unquote. Surfaces, skin, flesh, bold. Color is quite rare in sculpture. Yes, we saw it with some ancient, some medieval icons, some Baroque, and again with Anthony Caro and some of the 1990s Solowit pieces. But here we see Kapoor using color for many reasons, not just his Indian heritage. He creates space and meaning from color. Red is an important color in Indian culture. It's a powerful color, the color of blood, body, marriage, beauty, visceral strength. It has formal possibilities and cultural resonance. At simple roadside shrines in India, deities are washed in red dye. Red is earthly and physical, and it's also dreamlike and metaphysical. It's true that Indian culture, red is a powerful thing. It's the color that the bride wears, it's associated with the matriarchal, which is central to Indian psychology. So I can see what leads me there culturally, and there is more to it, says Kapoor. One of the ways color has been used in art since the 18th century is to move, as in Turner, from color to light. My tendency is to go from color to darkness. Red has a very powerful blackness. This overt color, this open and visually beckoning color, also associates itself with the dark interior world. And that's the reason I'm interested in it. Is that Indian? I don't know that it matters. Blue, a deeply saturated cobalt blue, not unlike the blue used by Eve Klein, um, whom Kapoor admires, represents the intangible, the vast sky, and emptiness of the dark abyss of the void seen through the hole in the ground or wall or rock. Kapoor believes that mystery is heightened by the use of blue. White for the Hindu is the color of purity, cleanliness, peace, knowledge, death, and spiritual rebirth. An all white piece, membrane rather than pigment, is Melancholia, 2004. It's a very large piece, about 100 feet long, and morphs from circle to square, perhaps square to circle, and acknowledges that the whole of Hindu sacred architecture can be reduced to the geometry of the square and the circle. Black represents that enigmatic hollow that Kapoor describes as, quote, the emptiness around things and the conceivable within them, which collide on reflecting surfaces, besiege the eyes, and provoke a disturbing unease, end quote. Void is not an empty space, but a space with substance, like the dark inner sanctum of a Hindu temple. To the viewer, it may be dizzying and disorienting, so the viewer is engaged, just as Kapoor would want. Vanta Black, the darkest black created by Surrey Nano Systems, is exclusively licensed by Kapoor for use in art. Vanta Black is not actually paint, but an insoluble coating material, industrial applied. Descent into Limbo uses a version of Vanta Black, and Kapoor's exhibition at the now postponed 2020 Venice Biennale was to introduce more works in Vanta Black. Kapoor's most colorful series of work, entitled 1,000 Names, 
are shapes that are pigment colors. They ooze onto the floor and obliterate the separation between art and architecture. The 1000 names refer to Vishnu, the Hindu god, and each name expresses a different attribute. Vishnu may manifest in any form. In 1978, after Kapoor had finished art school in London, he traveled to India and saw cones and piles of pigment, which on return to his studio, he shaped into cones, pyramids, mountains, and ziggurats like the Great Mosque of Samara in Iraq. The shapes also remind Kapoor of Jantar Mantar, the early Indian observatory. Some of the thousand names are geometric structures, the ziggurat, steps, arcs, cylinders, even the multiple breasts of Diana in Ephesus. David Josolet, the curator at the Contemporary Art Institute in Boston wrote, quote, the optical intensity of pure primary color and its extension on the floor serves to dissolve volume into a kind of hallucinatory color spot, end quote. Through these explorations, Kapoor considers these pieces as real space, space that is more than what is seen, space as a poetic. No color is present in some of the best known Kapoor works, just mirror, highly polished steel. It has no color of its own, but it reflects all color. Quote, what I've done over the years is to have evolved certain languages. To paraphrase, there's the pigment language, the void language, the mirror language, the wax language, as well as a few others. What I want to do is innovate in all of them. I feel that gives me freedom. The pigment language. Are all these pieces of pigment and evanescent or are they solid and structured? They are reactive as interest in one's object changes or parent surface is read. Pigment is the surface. Like a skin, it changes, breathes, and is seamless and elastic. Kapoor tells that it is what is important about these works is not that they are made out of pigment. The curious thing is that they appear to be made out of pigment. What you see is not what you get, and for me, the illusory is more poetically truthful than the real. I wanted to put truth to materials to one side and say that art is about a lot of things that are not present, end quote. Here, Kapoor works with the ideas about architecture and the body using color in its pure essence, both a thing and a non-thing tangible and visible. When I Am Pregnant, 1992, is a pigmented all-white piece that looks from the front like fuzz on the wall, inhabiting a non-objective state. Here is a flat plane morphing into a protrusion, a subtlety of Kapoor's genius and seen in many other works, some not so identifiable as this. Descent into Limbo, done in 1999, is it all black, another flat plane, or so it seems, with the optical intensity of pigment that dissolves volume. Quote, to make new art, you have to make new space, end quote. This is a whole new spatial adventure that we will address in more detail later. Perhaps gravity is at play and takes us down into that space, while the next piece, At the Edge of the World, takes us up. At the Edge of the World, 1998, is an enormous deep maroon hemisphere, pigment and fiberglass suspended from the ceiling. Here is dematerialized quality as one is standing in infinite space of pure saturated color. One is the, drawn into the center and naturally looks up. Kapoor's goal is that the viewer gets lost in the work and has a spiritual or at least poetic experience. He asks the viewer to become aware of another dimension and to feel the saturation of color that one would feel the red as one feels wet in a shower. One stands under a vast red dome, a little anxious of this huge object overhead, wondering about the gravitational pull. Kapoor explores gravity also in shooting into the corner, wherein cannonballs of red waxy paint are shot, overcoming gravity toward a white corner yielding an anti-form sculpture of blobs of self-made shape. We'll see more of the wax pieces below. For Kapoor, a measure of artistic success is how many layers of meaning and association can cohere around a single work. Kapoor reflects, quote, I am drawn to form that seems to have multi-layered interpretive possibilities, yet I'm not interested in overtly readable symbols. As much as I love Brancusi, a bird in space is too obvious for me. I think we've moved somewhere else. Negative interior form interests me. I'm also drawn to form that has a kind of iconic readability, 
what I call protoform. Kapoor is interested in the space beyond, skin as structure, elusive abstraction, the cultural hybrid of a truly transnational man who rejects late modernist truth materials, anti-illusion autonomy of art. Further, Kapoor eschews all evidence of the artist's hand, though occasionally some sketches are on display. Quote, Kapoor consciously undermines the insistence on the materiality of minimalist sculpture and spatial literalism. He says that the history of sculpture may be seen as the history of material. I am making works with the history of non-material between illusory and real, between mythology and ordinariness, end quote. Looking for the opposite of materiality, Kapoor seeks to create the ideal and transcendental. Kapoor says, quote, I use red a lot. I've gone so far as to title a work, My Red Homeland, end quote. When we look more into his pigment pieces, and especially the red coloration, we see works like My Red Homeland from 2003, 25 tons of red pigment and Vaseline, which is scraped ever so slightly by a blade arm as it revolves at one revolution per hour. It is both playful and erotic. Thiam consists of three tons of wax and paint and moves on rails through doorways. This piece has been created in France, Germany, and England with different size and shape doorways. The red waxy mass is shaped and reshaped. The German Haus der Kunst doorway scraped it into boxcar shapes, alluding to history and memory to human cargo shipped to the concentration camps. Svaya is a Sanskrit term referring to that which is made by its own accord other, rather than the hand of man. Known as Shiva, the erotic, ascetic, self-creating God who springs to force from its own body, a creation without a creator. Kapoor allows this form to evolve. Quote, somehow it is not enough that an object is made. It's related to the very old aspect of Indian thinking that there are certain kinds of objects that are self-manifest. They make themselves. Their mythology is that they are not made. I've always been interested in the mythology of the self-made object, end quote. If creativity does not belong to the artist, where else might it reside? Rather than mythologize the artist as a romantic genius, Kapoor invokes cultural myths of origin. Kapoor expands his thought, quote, I have always been interested in mythology of the self-made object, as if without an author, as if there by its own volition. In Indian thought, that's a pretty strong idea, end quote. The mirror language. Mirrored forms with no inherent color open up space, ideally unbounded by walls or other visual obstructions. Kapoor says, <clears throat> quote, one of the things about mirrored objects and especially forms that are inside out is that they seem to be very active, to be in various states of becoming. The interesting thing about the polished surface to me as that when it is really perfect, something else happens. It literally ceases to be physical. It levitates. It does something else, especially on concave surfaces. They cease to be physical, and it is that ceasing to be physical that I'm after." End quote. The liquefying and dissolving of solid form can be disorienting, thrilling, and seductive. In the mirror pieces, the result of mechanical processes of highly reflective surfaces become the subject. Quote, I am interested in the idea that a work can say, come on, come over here. I can engage you deeply and my space infiltrates yours. That may be why over the years I have been drawn to exotic materials that seem to pull you in. Scale is another thing that entice the viewer into the object, end quote. The mirrored pieces attract attention and mesmerize the viewer so sees something completely different with each step. They are playful and fun. The S-curves, created in 2006, neither deep nor flat, show the vitality of nature and the virtuality. The viewer is live in multiple simultaneous abstracted iterations of himself. While Donald Judd and Saul Lewitt talked of repetition and iteration, what Kapoor has created is totally different. It's not the repetition of the artwork, but the reputation and iteration of the viewer's experience. One size changes. One is sometimes upside down and sometimes right side up, sometimes backwards and sometimes not. As Barnett Newman said, scale is not a matter of size, but content. It's less dependent on actual size than on manipulations of proportion and space. Kapoor is a master of those manipulations. 
C-curve created in 2007 was created for the Louvre's Kursabad court, the Mesopotamian collection of bas-reliefs, examples of the power of religions, the origin of sculpture and civilization. C-curve is convex on one side such that one can see and read the reliefs, while the opposite concave side is unsettling and unrecognizable, stretched and inverted images, contrasting illusions, just the kind of contrast that interests Kapoor, appearance and disappearance, falsehood and truth, knowing and unknowing, visible and invisible, splitting and multiplying. Scooped shapes, fractals and smooth, invite the viewer in. These two identical mirrors are opposite each other to create interesting reflections, but you can only see in them one at a time. Ishi's light, created in 2003, was named for his son Ishan. It's a highly polished, dark, blood red lacquer mirror-like interior in a deeply concave structure that interiorly distorts and inverts the familiar visible world. Mirrored sculptures for public places include Cloudgate and Sky Mirror, created in 2001 initially, 15 tons of highly polished steel, three stories tall and set at about a 60 degree angle reflecting mostly sky. Kapoor sees no hierarchy to form, but prefers organic and curved. Designed to interact with external settings and public spaces, Sky Mirror creates illusory distortions while also reflecting atmospheric conditions. Part of the viewer's experience are the shifts in scale, perspective as one moves about, and awareness of nature through a live encounter with the sky. The void language. Void pieces are another series of works wherein what you see is not what you see. The voids live as holes in architecture rather than objects in space. Kapoor sees the void not as an empty space, but as darkness, the uncanny, the mysterious, filling the space. He says they are psychosocial, not just a dark space, but a space full of darkness. These void pieces, some carefully carved inside a rock slab, unlike most sculpture in which the exterior is carved, reveal an image inside. Here it is not an empty void, but perhaps inhabited by a ghost. Is this void a flat surface? Does it protrude out or is it sunk into the wall? Only careful re reading will reveal it. This is a Holocaust memorial, and one can envision and imagine many images inside. The deep blue pigment draws attention, yet the interest is in the deep blue crescent void. How deep is the void? Here we see Leviathan again. It's a huge void space that is constructed or made space. Herein, the artist chooses to put the viewer inside and outside in relation to beauty, form, and history of sculpture. From no one place can the viewer see the whole of it, its massive scale of building and the scale of the work. One must move to another angle, another direction, so the aesthetic journey changes forever and there is new accumulation of meaning. It's always partial, always part of something. To see it, you have to have a plan in your head. Sculpture that reveals the plan is dead to Kapoor. First, you must go in to view, then walk out and go in another door to see another inside or outside of it. We have knowledge of the whole object, but its experience can only be understood at any partial time. Descent into Limbo is a void piece and to me the ultimate sculpture. One questions, where is it? What is it? It's not tangible. It's not three-dimensional. Does it exist above ground? It's not on the plane of the viewer. One peers in and sees nothing, no reflection of any light. Is it bottomless or a merely ground level surface and flat? How does gravity play into this? One is dizzied and disoriented as if in a cave with the lights turned out or in a snowstorm white out when one cannot tell if one is standing or lying, moving or motionless. This void is being and nothingness. The void space is concealed and yet, Descent into Limbo is a three-dimensional piece with those dimensions underground and using the darkest black that absorbs more than 99% of light. As Kapoor said, to make new art, you have to make a new space. And Descent is whole new spatial adventure. But don't fall in as a man did in Portugal. 
As George Brock said, art is meant to disturb and nothing disturbs more than descent into limbo, both the thought of descent below ground level, the thought of limbo and the artwork itself. Kapoor's brilliant exploration of gravity and space, up and down, visible and invisible, light and dark, void and present, is played by descent into limbo, the black hole empty space at one's feet. In Kapoor's world, space is not empty, it is filled with darkness, it is sheer genius. Here are the drawings of descent into limbo that show how it is made and that it is, in fact, three-dimensional. A related artwork is Dissension, a black whirlpool. In this work, the water itself is the art, moving, whirling, mesmerizing. Nicholas Baum says of this piece, quote, in the manner of conceptual art, Kapoor describes making art as a process of research led by the work rather than the artist's imagination, end quote. Making water into sculpture was challenging. Elaborating on that, Kapoor says that, quote, it seems to me there are two basic ways of working. One that the artist leads the work and the other is that the work leads the artist. The work ought to lead the artist, not the artist the work. For the artist to lead the work, one is, must assume that the artist knows what he or she is doing and has something to say. When the work leads the artist, the process is one of discovery. I don't have anything I'm dying to say, but I do know that if I allow myself to excavate, to research, the process leads to meanings that one could never have logically imagined. Kapoor feels that, quote, it is my role as an artist to bring expression. It's not my role to be expressive. I've got nothing in particular to say. I don't have any message to give anyone, but it is my role to bring expressions, let's say to define means that allow phenomenological and other perceptions which one might use, one might work with, and then move toward a poetic experience. Sir Anish Kapoor, a Hindu father, Iraqi Jewish mother, schooled in Israel and England, practicing Jew and Zen, is truly transnational artist and architect like Zaha Hadid and I am Pei, who share their heritage with layers of history and memory to build bridges between cultures, East and West, and therein create their own unique and expiring marks on our world. Kapoor's work is abstract, not only in form, yet also in many associations and multiple meanings for the physical world, body meanings and constructed form, and also what he sees as important spiritual questions of origin and belief. He does this by presenting us with contradictory elements, coincidentia oppositorum, the coexistence of opposites, metaphysical polarities, presence and absence, being and nothingness, place and non-place, solid and intangible, objective and non-objective, convex and concave, male and female, earth and sky, matter and spirit, visible and invisible, mind and body multiple meanings interior and exterior. In the presence of Kapoor works, one thinks and wonders and feels a whole range of emotion, unsettled feelings, vertigo or extreme anxiety, fear, awe, wonder, the presence of a true genius.